Okay, hey, welcome back. Today we're going to continue with research methods statistics. So this is unit one. It's a, probably about the sixth video or so that I've, I've been able to put together for you. Statistics are sometimes really difficult for some students. And for other students, they say, hey, I have a stats class right now. And uh, they're very comfortable with numbers and think in that realm. It, it's not a lot of math, but there are some concepts that are important. Now, how much of this do you need to be able to do on the AP test? I would say not that much, but understanding the whole concept will be able to get you to a point where you, if you come across a question and something about standard deviation is in there, you may not have to figure out or compute standard deviation, but if you understand where it comes from, you're going to have a deeper sense of knowledge about it. So. Let's check it out. As someone once said, there are lies, dang lies, and statistics. And you know, people use statistics in all kinds of different ways to prove points, to kind of win arguments, to sometimes make some lies or stretch the truth. You have to kind of be careful with statistics and with research methods and with the research um, that you would do for psychology. You really have to be careful because a lot of times we're taking a small segment of the population, a sample, and then trying to infer uh, an overall, um, you know, an overall effect on the population. So that's called inferential statistics. We're going to look at that in a second. We're going to start first with descriptive statistics, though. So let's just look at what we looked at last time. We said before, how do psychologists ask and answer questions? It's kind of what we're talking about here with research methods. This time, we're going to look at data. And, you know, not this data from Star Trek world, but um, the data that you would get if you were um, going to study and look at a research project. If you were going to study and look at data or information, to make a case for J.J. Watt last year as the 2010 or 2012 Defensive Player of the Year, you would have a pretty darn good case because there are few players in NFL history who've had a better year than he had. He had, um, you know, 69 uh, tackles, 81 combo tackles, 12 assists. And if you look at it over a 16-game season, he had 20 and a half sacks. You get a half a sack if two guys uh, get credit for sacking the quarterbacks. Each guy gets a half. Forced four fumbles. But what he did that was really amazing as a defensive lineman, basically defensive end, he was able to knock down and defend 16 passes. And that's more than most like defensive backs have in the NFL. So he had a pretty amazing year. And some people that were trying to make a case for him to be that player of the year or defensive player of the year or MVP of the league, oftentimes they'd look at the statistical breakdown because the numbers were so startling. So that's one way you can do it. What are we doing with numbers? We're looking to distinguish the difference between the purposes of descriptive and inferential statistics. There's two different kinds. Descriptive we'll look at first. Inferential we'll get to after that. We're going to discuss the value of reliance on operational definitions and measurements and behavioral research. We've talked about operational definitions, variables. Measurements are where we're going to look at here a little bit, measuring data anyway. And the last uh, star point up there is statistical procedures. Analyze and interpret data. And let us see what the unaided eye is missing. Good example is the pretty awesome little cartoon there. She convinces him, hey, face it, I am your st statistically significant other. He may not know it, but he has a girlfriend. And she's been able to prove that to him. And how do you know that? Because he says your math is irrefutable. So meaningful description of data is important in research and the misinterpretation of data can lead to incorrect interpretations. So let's look at this little graphic down here at the bottom. You've got two things that we're comparing. Songs in the Rolling Stone 500 Greatest All-Time 
list, all time greatest songs, and then U.S. crude oil field production in the lower 48 states. Not in Hawaii, which I don't know that you could do that there. I don't know. And not in Alaska, which I guess they're not counting here for some reason. I bet the oil production's higher there, but I have no idea. So if you look at this, it's kind of interesting that like 1950 and 51, there was no data. Either they didn't have any readings or we weren't producing any. But you also see that it seems to mirror, uh, U.S. crude oil field production seems to mirror output of the greatest songs in Rolling Stones 500 songs of all time. These things are not related, are they? In any way, really. I mean, I wouldn't think, and maybe you could make a case, but what would you have to do to make that case? You'd have to look at more information, more statistics, not just the songs on a list and U.S. field oil production. I've said this before in another presentation. Correlation does not mean causation. So keep that in mind and keep thinking through that. And also keep thinking about the in misin misinterpretation or the uh, incorrect interpretation of information and data because it can really throw you, throw people off. Descriptive statistics first. You've seen these probably and you're pretty familiar with it. The measures of central tendency, mean, median, and mode. And measures of variation, which are range and standard deviation. So, on the right side, it says, I am within one standard deviation from the mean. I am the 68 percent. You may not be familiar with what that's talking about. We had a little movement here called um, the the 99. What is it? 90. Gosh, I can't remember. I am the one percent. So, or not the one percent. I'm the 99 percent. One percent is the very very wealthiest. And everybody else is in this 99 percentile range. And that was like a statement for saying that the ultra rich in the country are seeming to run everything and I don't know that they're wrong in saying that but uh, it was the uh, the protests that were happening across the country so they're just kinda of making fun of that if you're within one standard deviation of the mean you are within the 68 percent as probably the majority of most people on on there so standard deviation the bell-shaped curve mean median and mode so let's look at those things first First of all, the mean, median, and mode are three kinds of averages, and the mean is the average you're used to. When you add up numbers and divide the numbers, divide that by the number of numbers, you know, uh, you're going to get the average, and that's just like a batting average. We'll look at that in a second. The median is the middle, and it's the middle in the value in the list of numbers. So to find the median. You have your numbers listed in numerical order. You go from like smallest to largest, largest, smallest, whatever. And in the middle of that, you would have a median number. And the mode is the most often occurring value. If there's no number that's repeated, then there's no mode. The range is the difference between the largest and smallest values. That's the range of numbers. So you've, you've probably seen some of these before, I'm certain in math or other science classes. So what's the mean? It's the usual average. So if you had 13 plus 18 plus 13 plus 14 plus 13, 16, 14, 21, 13, divide that by 9, you would get 15. So the mean is the usual average, the average of those numbers. And if you look at those, you can think, okay, there's a, there's a low of, what, 13, there's a few 13s, it's a high of 21. You could probably see that potentially there could be, 15 could be it. But it says, note that the mean isn't the value from the original list. It's the, it's the common result. So you should not assume that your mean will be one of the original numbers. And is the number 15 in the list? It is not. So it's a, just an average. Joe DiMaggio there at the bottom is uh, seen, there's a New York Times photo of pretty f kind of famous uh, picture of him kind of uh, sl slicing through the, the ball. He had a 56 game hitting streak. It's still a record and it's an amazing record. He had a hit in 56 straight games. Interestingly, he had a longer hitting streak 
in the minor leagues when he played in the Pacific Coast League. I think it was 60-something games, 63 or something. But Joe DiMaggio was the AL MVP, had a batting average of 357. This is 1941, right before, you know, World War II. What's real interesting is the mean is the average. Sometimes the average is mean. And that's what my little baseball analogy here will show you. So any number, uh, any baseball player's mean would be the equal, would equal the number of hits divided by the number of at bats. That doesn't count walks or fielder's choice, sacrifices, those kind of things. But an actual at bat where you've hit the ball and you made an out. DiMaggio's 56 game hitting streak was amazing, but so was Ted Williams' um, uh, season. He hit 406 in the same season, and no players ever had that high of an average since then. Very few have come close to 400. So DiMaggio won the American League Most Valuable Player, probably because he was from New York, even though he had a lesser statistical year than Williams. And you can see the statistics down there at the bottom. Baseball averages are really just a mean. It is measured by dividing the number of hits over the number of at-bats. And sometimes real life can be pretty mean as well. And if you look at the batting average, Joe DiMaggio's average was way lower down here at the bottom, the BA is batting average. He had a 357 average compared to 406 for Ted Williams. And just about every statistical number that would really count, including walks, which is hugely higher, um, nah, st- statistically insignificant stolen bases, RBIs, he had five more, home runs, Williams had seven more. Um, but Joe DiMaggio had more hits. That's pretty much it. I mean, uh, runs scored higher for uh, Williams, so it's, I've always thought that was really interesting. But how do they come up with the MVP? It's it's voting. Baseball writers get together and vote on it. What's real interesting here is uh, Joe Dema- or Ted Williams who wrote a wrote a book, and he said all of these spots, these are all account for a baseball within the hitting zone. He felt like this was the pitch right here down the middle. That was his 400 batting average hit. If you threw the ball here. He was going to get a hit four out of ten times. So it gives you kind of an idea of um, of how this works. Okay. Let's look at the mode, the median, and the mean in just a little bit of a different way. Okay. The median is the middle, and I think of the median as like you know there probably should be a median down the middle of 1960. Maybe there'd be a few less accidents a year. It's one of the worst roads in feels like America to drive on so be careful if you just got your license especially so to get the middle value okay the median is the middle value you'd have to rewrite the list in order so if those were our list of numbers from before we're writing those in order there are nine numbers in the list so the middle one would be what nine plus one divided by two equals 10 divided by 2 is the fifth number and you look at the fifth number the fifth number is what the median is 14 it's kind of off my screen there a little bit but you get the picture it's 14 so how what's another way you can look at this if you've ordered the numbers okay there's one two three four one two three four the middle number is 14 that's how I look at it I just put them out in that order and look at it in that that function. So let's look let's look at these numbers. And I think these are the same that we just had, are they? 13 13 13 14 14 16 18 21. Yeah, same numbers. So let's look at it again. The mode is the number that's repeated more often than any other. So what is the mode? 13. Makes sense, doesn't it? The largest value is 21. The smallest is 13. So what is the range? 21 minus 13, the range is 8. What's the mean? The mean's 15. We talked about that earlier, so you remember that one maybe. What's the median? The median is 14. It's right in the middle. What's the mode? The mode is 13. It's the most often occurring number. And what is the range, as we've said? The range is 8. The difference between 13 and 21. So in real life, suppose a company is considering expanding into an area and is 
studying the size of containers that competitors are offering. So this is kind of a business thing here. If you're thinking about it in this way, you're studying the size of containers that a competitor is offering. Would the company be more interested in the mean, the median, or the mode of the containers? The answer is the mode because they want to know what the size that tends to sell most often is. So the most is the mode. This is a skewed di distribution. You can see that it seems to be sort of weighted on one side compared to the other. It's kind of like they're sitting on a seesaw and 70 is the mean. So 70 is kind of like the point in the middle. So is the mean in this case the best indicator of family income? What do you think? Probably not in this case because the outliers, especially 710 or $710,000 a year, this one guy here on the end, is way out. In fact, they've got to do a little uh, squiggly line there to show that it would be even further out than this. So the range and standard deviation come into play to help it be more of an accurate description of these statistics. So let's look at that. This is another way to look at skewed distribution. So it's pretty much the same thing, maybe in a, a reverse way, because on the right side here of the graphic are, it says these two groups include households reporting income over greater than $200,000. So $250,000 a year here, all the way to the other end, which is you know under $5,000 a year. So you can see it's pretty much skewed or pushed to the lower end. And uh, this is a 2010 estimate. And what's the median household income? Roughly 50,000. Here in this one of this population, it was 70. This is an actual distribution from the U.S. Census Bureau, um, and they published this in 2011, the Annual Social and Economic Supplement. So, to show you some actual numbers here, the top 10% report income greater than 135 thousand dollars per year and uh, I would say that I'd be interested to see where this goes even further but that's a whole different thing but you can tell the mean median mode would be kind of skewed so let's look at measures of variation the range is the difference between the highest and the lowest score distributions we've already mentioned this the standard deviation is the average between each score and the mean so what is the zero point here in the line down the middle? That's the mean. Now, in a large standard deviation, the red line, more uh, spread out scores from the mean than, say, the small SD or the small standard deviation, where you see them bunched up towards the mean in the middle and no scores out to the edges. So more scores bunched together around the mean. These are not what you'd consider to be a normal curve where it's pretty proportional across the, the whole uh, point. So good news about standard deviation. You will never have to create a standard deviation from scratch or figure out how to do it. However, knowing how, whoops, excuse me, knowing how and knowing what it represents uh, will help you be able to understand it better. So let's go. Let's look at this. Which of the following sets of data have the greatest SD or standard deviation? 1, 5, 7, and 30. Or 5, 10, 12, and 18. Or 30, 32, 34, 35. I know some students, ooh, 30, 32, 34, 35 are bigger numbers. How did you figure out which one was the biggest? or greatest standard deviation? Well, can you estimate it by looking at the spread of the numbers? What's the, the, the what are we looking at the range here? Is from one to 30, is that bigger than from five to 18? Yes. Is one to 30 bigger or greater range than 30 to 35? It is. So that's one way you can kind of look at it by looking at the spread. You can find the mean and then compare each number to the mean and then you'd have a better look at it. So that's two quick ways to do it.
but like I said, you don't, you're not going to have to do that on a test, but you will see the normal curve and there are some certain things you're going to just need to know. What is the normal distribution? It's a distribution of scores that produces a bell shaped symmetrical curve. We'll see this mostly on IQ tests down the road with the intelligence chapter. In this normal curve, the mean, median, and mode fall exactly at the same point, which is the zero line right here. That is the mean, that is the median, and that is the mode. Everything else falls into order. So let's look on the right side there. It says the span of one standard deviation on either side of the mean covers about 68.2%. And you can see that it'd be right here. We're going to see another graphic that shows this in a second. So what is this showing us? The average IQ is 100. So right down the center, the mean or the average, below where it says zero, the Weschler IQ, 100. Stanford Binet IQ, 100. So you get a, a sense or a feel for it. Um, most people fall within 68.2%. They fall in the 85 to 115 range. So most people are right there in the middle. And how do you know it's most people? That's the biggest bubble on the curve. It's way up here. That's a lot of people that are falling in this area right here. So IQ extremes above 130 and below 70 are pretty rare. And there are very few people in those extremes, whether highly intelligent or otherwise. Okay, maybe this is helping you understand where we're going to use it. There's only one way to do this, and that's to write it down and then memorize it. Because on the test, the, the AP test, they may not give you the bell curve with all these percentages. They m just may say something about how many um, standard deviations um, from, the, from the mean is the 68.2% of people or 27% of people that's one standard deviation so how do we look at this how do we see it pretty simple um, and also I want to show you this at the top 50% of people the population is on one side and 50% on the other side so it's representing the entire population the middle part the blue part there is blue at the bottom one standard deviation from the mean and this is the mean down the center so one standard deviation either side within one standard deviation of the mean is 68.2%. Uh, 2, two standard deviations from the mean, 1, 2 from the mean, and 1, 2 from the mean is 95.4%. And they have that down here for you too. And you know what number 3 is going to be, right? There's the, the orange line. So it goes um, three standard deviations, one, two, three standard deviations from the mean on either side, you're talking about 99.73. There's a little bit more on either side that'd be four standard deviations from the mean. So I got a little uh, Loch Ness funny down there, I guess, was what that is. Okay, Shawhorn has a really good video it's within the notes I'm not gonna play the video in here but it's a really good video clip on understanding standard deviation and I probably talked to you about Shawhorn in class but he has taught this AP psych since the, the year that they invented the course so the guy knows what he's talking about so let's go to our, our next slide here if it will let me pop down to the next slide okay a skewed distribution remember this one just looked at it a minute ago well is the mean the best indicator of family income probably not because of the outliers right 710 is one such example so the range and standard deviation come into play to help us see a more accurate depiction of statistics so let's step back to the next one here is a skewed distribution negative versus positive so the negative is seen there on the left where A is. B is your normal curve, no skew, and it's right down the middle. And C is positively skewed. So what does that mean? The majority of scores are above the mean. One or few extremely low scores force the mean to be less than the median score. 
So here's the median score. The mean is pushed this way. The average is pushed this way. The mode is lagging behind as well. So that's you're getting a negative push from this. What about the positive direction? You're getting a positive push. Majority of scores below the mean, one or a few extremely high scores force the mean to be greater than the median score. So it's just the same thing, but in the positive direction or opposite direction. These are examples of normal and skewed distributions. So understand that these are data points along these curves. These are numbers of people. The frequency of them is up along the, the axis there. So, so far we've been looking at descriptive statistics. So let's talk inferential statistics and you're going to infer things here. So it involves estimating what's happening in a sample population for the purpose of making decisions about a population's characteristics. So from a sample population, a part of the whole, to the whole. It's based on probability and so it's not always going to be perfect. So it says here, basically inferential stats will allow you to say this. If it worked for this certain population, like you see at the bottom there, on the left, the red dot and then the red curve, that's the sample population. If it worked for this population, we can estimate it will work for the rest of the population, which is the rest of the yellow area. So an example would be drug testing. If meds have worked for the sample population, we can then estimate that they will have the same effect on the rest of the population. If, this, if everything was done correctly. There's always a chance for error because you're not testing everybody and whatever the findings may be so the hypothesis and results must be tested for significance and you're going to see if it's significantly uh, if it's statistically significant or not and so there's low error room there so another one on the bottom right says population use sample and then draw an inference sample and draw an inference I, hopefully that makes you understand, helps you understand it some. Look at this next slide. So, statistically significant means this. The difference observed between two groups is probably not due to chance. The difference instead is likely due to a real difference between the samples. This means, in, in other words, we're, we're looking at the data is significant. When the likelihood of a difference being due to chance is less than five times out of 100. We have a way to look at that and to refer to it. And that's P is less than 0 0.05. So in other words, there's a 95% chance or greater likelihood that any difference seen is due to your independent variable shown numerically as P less than 0 0.05. I don't know how you remember this, but there's really no other way. You just got to memorize some of this stuff and just understand it and know it. But it's 0 0.05, it's 5 out of 100, so um, that's the outliers. So, if, you know, that's just statistically, it's, it's data is significant. The likelihood of a difference is due to the chance that it's less than 5 out of 100, okay? This is important because if research is statistically significant, it means that the results are probably not a fluke or not due to chance, like we have discussed here. Now, some of this you may have to, you know, kind of pause, rewatch, and rethink about again before maybe it clicks or write this stuff down. So just watching, it may not click. And we're going to get a little confusing here with inferential statistics, so hang in there because next is the null hypothesis. And this is our last part to talk about. This is very confusing for some students, so hang in there. Uh, I don't know that this would definitely be on the AP test, but it has been before sometimes, and so I want to make sure you understand it. This states that there is no difference between two sets of data. Basically, the opposite of your hypothesis. So a null hypothesis is, a null hypothesis is the opposite hypothesis. All right? What's the purpose of this? <laughs> some, some of you may ask. Until the research shows by proving the original slash alternative hypothesis that there is a that there is a difference, the researcher must assume 
that any difference present is due to chance. So you have to have that assumption until the research shows there is a difference. In other words, not due to sig statistical significance. So in other words, not due to st statistical significance, as I'm trying to say, statistical significance. So the bottom here, maybe this will help you. You, you have a test statistic, statistic. Why are you rejecting the null on the other side, but accepting it in the middle? Those are your, basically, your research will show you some data and some information. So um, the guy in the center there, I know him from the movies. Hey girl, you must be P greater than 0.05% because I failed to reject you. And the last one here says, I can't believe schools are still teaching kids about the null hypothesis. I remember reading a big study that conclusively disproved it years ago. You might want to come back and watch this after we do the next part. Those might make sense to you. They may not still. This is tricky stuff. But let's look at this. This may help some. I have two examples here. We'll look at the very straightforward approach here. And then I'll give you an actual like maybe a real world example in the next part. Hopefully not an example that will ever really happen. But here is the null hypothesis. There's error type one errors and type two errors. And first year I taught this, it was so confusing for kids to try to explain it to them. Hopefully this will help you. A type one error rejects the null, choosing the original hypothesis, yet the null is actually true. So that's an error. You don't want to have errors, but you could make them. Type 2 error accepts the null, yet the original hypothesis is actually correct. You're accepting in the type 2 error the opposite hypothesis, yet the original hypothesis is correct. So you've made an error. You understand? At the bottom, on this left side it says decision researcher makes and at the top the truth about the population that you're looking at or studying so let's look at this if the decision maker rejects the null in other words accepts the original hypothesis however the truth is that the null is true about the population. The truth about the population is the null is actually true and you've rejected the null. What have you done? Type one error. Get it? Look at the next part here. The decision the researcher makes after looking at the data and everything is I am going to reject the null except the original hypothesis but look up here. The truth about the population is the null is false. Correct decision. Not an error. Way to go dude. If you accept the null on the bottom part here, okay, and the null is true, correct decision. Way to go, dude. You got it right. Awesome. Accept the null and the null is false, then you made a type 2 error. So what's a type 1 error? You've rejected the null and the null is true. Rejected the null and the null is true. And the null is the opposite hypothesis. Type 2 error is you accept the null and the null is false. Okay? I don't know how else to explain that to you other than do this. Let's look at a real world potential example that hopefully never happens at our school. Although it has. A long time ago. Here is the hypothesis. The original hypothesis is a bomb threat's called into the front office. So we need to evacuate the school. That's the original hypothesis. But what's the null? There's no bomb in the school. So we do not need to evacuate. So there's no bomb. So it's a null hypothesis. The null sign is over the bomb. There's no bomb. Let's look about let's look at the bottom part here and then we'll fill in the chart as we go. You've rejected the null and accepted the original hypothesis which is a bomb threat was called in the front office so we need to evacuate the school. You've accepted that. But the null hypothesis was true. You've made a type 1 error. 
the students evacuated the bomb squad does not find the bomb you've erred on the side of caution so everybody is safe and happy but you've made an error that's probably okay let's say you've rejected the null right here you've rejected the null you've accepted the original hypothesis that bomb threat was called in the front office we need to evacuate but the null was false meaning there was a bomb and we need to evacuate so correct decision students evacuated the bomb squad comes in the bomb is safely uh, removed or deactivated and everybody is safe here's the hero way to go correct decision let's look down here at the bottom you've accepted the null there is no bomb in the school so we don't need to evacuate maybe you've made that decision you're the principal it's the correct decision if the null is true that there is no bomb and we do not need to evacuate so you've not inter interrupted class you've not evacuated there was no bomb no students were hurt everybody stayed in class safe and sound yay for you you got lucky though didn't you because you never know let's look at the opposite you've accepted the null there's no bomb but the null is false meaning that there is no bomb there is a bomb type 2 error here the bomb threat is ignored students stay in class the bomb goes off students could be injured this is an extreme example but hopefully you're getting the picture here of how this works because it can be a little bit confusing the null hypothesis is the opposite of your original hypothesis and you can make two types of errors one where you reject the null and what happens the null is true the other error you can make type 2 error is you've accepted the null but yet the null was false again you may, you may need to rewind this and rewatch this and think through it and maybe even write it down in your notes and please bring some questions to class if you're still having trouble with it because descriptive and inferential statistics can be a little bit tricky for some students others of you may be like I got this man Hopefully everyone will have gotten it soon because it'd be great to make sure that everybody understands it. So bring your questions to class. Till next time, DFTB.